This week's video requires very little introduction because I am joined by a legend, Catholic Angels apologist Jimmy Aiken. And my goal on this episode is to put to test some of the things that, that I was processing as I was journeying from the evangelical church into Catholicism that are really at the forefront of, of my thinking and that are, are, are so uh, in the debate sphere, so discussed and talked about all over YouTube in, in debates and conversations right now. This is this is live, awesome, hot conversations around Sola Scriptura. And so I'm going to give Jimmy some of the, the, the strongest arguments in favor of Sola Scriptura, and he's going to give us reasons to doubt those arguments. This week on the show, it should be fantastic. I'll get out of the way right now and let you enjoy this, because it's fantastic. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the bell, subscribe to the channel, leave some comments, do all those fun things that you do uh, to follow the show. And thanks for watching. If you are listening on podcasts, uh, on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, please leave a rating and a review. That helps to push the podcast out to more people. And thanks for, for listening there. Uh, this week for, uh, yeah, it's our 200th episode, which is awesome. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> We're joined by not a specter, but but Jimmy Aiken. Uh, he is senior apologist at Catholic Answers. He uh, the author of some fantastic books, including the Bible is a Catholic book, Drama of Salvation, Teaching with Authority, and he is a proprietor uh, of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, a fantastic podcast and YouTube uh, channel as well, available on YouTube, uh, tackling some incredible mysteries from the perspective of faith and and reason. Jimmy, my favorite podcast. So I don't know if that says about if that's a positive or negative for you show but cool thank you thanks for being here to me to tackle the topic this week of soil scriptura and, and welcome back to the show thank you it's my pleasure to be back uh this is gonna be a, a good one jimmy the the intention with with this show for uh for for me this was one of those things that got me started on the journey from evangelical christian to to the catholic faith and so for me this is one of those topics that especially uh, these days i feel like the the good old debates of the late 80s and 90s between like you know i think patrick madrid, patrick madrid carl keating and their protestant uh interlocutors i, I feel like th that the spirit that era of those kind of debates is kind of uh Returning once again, because YouTube is a, is a place where there's just been all kinds of, on this topic lately, uh, debates and dialogues and, and debriefs and response videos back and forth. And of course, uh, you yourself have a few of those conversations, uh, people like Trent Horn, your colleague, uh, Swan Sona, this... Uh, you know, Captain Christianity hosts these debates. Quince of the Aquinas hosts debates like these. I feel like this is just a time that's just right for these awesome conversations. Uh, and, and so, I thought for our two hundredth to to kind of revisit one of the topics that for me was was huge. And I thought, who better to do this with than somebody uh, as cordial, fitting for the show at. at as you, Jimmy. So, so thanks for doing it with us. Thanks for being here once again. Well, thank you. Sola Scriptura is something that I had to seriously work through when I was becoming Catholic as well. And I've continued to think about it and write about it for the last 30 years. And so I think I have something to say on the subject. So happy to, <laughs> happy to be here. Oh, I think so too. So I want to say from the outset that there are definitions of this that that vary, and I want mm -hmm. to tackle that exact kind of question in a little bit. But I want to say for our for our purposes here, we're going with what I think has become kind of this the standard definition that I think some of the the, the top Protestant apologists are using this, these days, mm -hmm. which is the idea that sola scriptura is the sole infallible rule for Christian faith and and morals. So period. We'll go with period. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. it. Now, before we be begin, you know, you suggested we talk first about the idea of how this relates to the Protestant teaching of the sufficiency of Scripture. So let's tackle that first and then get into the rest of this, I think. Yeah. So there's been a shift in how Protestant apologists tend to present Sola yeah. Scriptura. Um, back when I was an evangelical, the it, it, it was commonly explained that Sola Scriptura meant that if you um, if you adhere to Sola Scriptura, then you have to be able to prove a doctrine from the Bible. doesn't matter what the doctrine is, it has to be proved from the Bible. That doesn't mean that it has to be explicitly stated in the Bible. You know, the doctrine of the Trinity 
for example, is not explicitly stated in the Bible. There is no single passage that says there is one God who is three co-equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's something that's implicit in Scripture. There are individual passages that you can put together and you know show that that must be the case, and that's what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. But the doctrine of the Trinity is implicit in Scripture. It's not explicitly stated. And so the idea was that uh, under Sola Scriptura, you have to be able to prove every Christian doctrine from Scripture, either by finding it explicitly stated or by, as the Westminster Confession puts it, by good and necessary inference from things that are stated in Scripture. And that was the standard way that the doctrine was presented. Um, other Christians who didn't adhere to Sola Scriptura were criticized for having unbiblical doctrines, ones that couldn't be proven from Scripture alone. And, um, and so that was the general conception. But in more recent years, there now Catholic apologists pointed out big problems with that understanding. For one, it, it, it doesn't meet its own test, because there's nothing in Scripture that states or implies that you have to prove every doctrine from Scripture alone. It's just not there. There are a few verses that Protestant apologists would try to use to support the idea, but when you examine them carefully, they actually don't support it. They don't prove what is intended. And so in recent years, Protestant apologists have begun taking another tack where they restrict the definition of sola scriptura to, I think, to make it a smaller target so that it's it's harder to criticize it. Um, and the, the new definition that's used is sola scriptura means that Scripture alone is the infallible rule of faith. It's the only infallible rule of faith that we have. And so um, that's the new claim, but I don't think that the new definition really, really is that helpful. Now, first thing I'd point out is, you know, theological terms can be used in different senses, and so, you know, it's it, if you want to redefine a term, okay, fine, we can talk about the new term and, you know, the new definition that you're using. Um, but if you look like in Protestant confessions of faith, like the 39 articles of the Anglican Communion or the Westminster Confession that's used by um, Reformed and some Baptists, or if you look at, you know, the Book of Concord that's used in Lutheran circles, none of them identify sola scriptura as this. Right. They will say things like scripture is the only infallible rule of faith, but they don't say that's what sola scriptura is. And they also say things like you have to be able to prove doctrines from Scripture, either explicitly or by good and necessary inference. So they contain both ideas, and recent Protestant apologists have been restricting the term sola scriptura to just the first of those two. But that leaves open the question, well then, so is Scripture sufficient to give us all of Christian doctrine? And um, and Protestants typically will say, oh, yeah, 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 it's Scripture is sufficient. The sufficiency of Scripture is, is still a true doctrine. Um, and I don't think—and it's just a different doctrine than sola scriptura. And so, okay, fine, if you want to use terms that way, that's okay, but I don't really think that helps you, because if— you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture to teach us the whole of Christian doctrine, then you're going to have to be able to prove the sufficiency of Scripture from Scripture alone. And there aren't passages that state or imply by good and necessary inference that every Christian doctrine must be proved by Scripture alone. So I think that, um, that this move, while it rhetorically, you know, for debate purposes, can make some sense to try to make Sola Scriptura a smaller target, it really doesn't help because the problem replicates with the sufficiency of Scripture. And so I don't think it's an ultimately successful move. 
Yeah, that, that's very well said. Yeah, and, and there have there have been interesting pushbacks as well from different debates that we've seen on these kind of questions as 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 well. For for our purposes here, so to kind of set the table, I guess for us, what would the alternative to sola scriptura be uh, in the Catholic approach? Just briefly, because we have an approach that involves <laughs> scripture tradition and the magisterium working kind of in in, in concord. So, mm-hmm. how does this differ from a sola scriptura approach to to the Christian faith? So the um, the Catholic understanding is that God gave His Word to man over a period of time. Uh, the 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 part of God's word that's binding and authoritative, and He gave it in many different ways. Um, you know, He gave it both orally, which was actually the original form in which God gave His word, because the Hebrews didn't adopt writing until around. 1000 BC. Some other cultures in the ancient Near East had it earlier, like in Egypt and Mesopotamia. It goes back to a little before 3000 BC. But the Hebrews really didn't start using it until about 1000 BC. That's when we find the earliest Hebrew writings. And yet, they had a relationship with God before that point. And so God originally gave his word orally. In fact, he gave his word orally to at least some people all the way down through history from the beginning of the human race even before the invention of writing, a little before 3000 BC. So the oral proclamation of God's word is the original form. Then when the Israelites adopted writing, they began to record God's word in writing, and that's what we know as scripture. The word scriptura in Latin means writing, and so these are the holy writings that contain God's word. But they also continued to preach God's word orally, and it's often pointed out, Jesus didn't write any books, and neither did the apostles in the beginning. They preached the Word of God, including distinctives that were new as part of Christian revelation, like Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. That was That's not stated in, and you can't deduce Jesus's name from the Old Testament or <laughs> the fact he was going to grow up in Nazareth or things like that. So there were new elements to the Word of God that were preached orally by Jesus and by the apostles for a period of time before any of the New Testament was written. And so the principle that the apostles themselves used, the paradigm that they used, involved both the written scriptures and what we can call apostolic tradition, which was an oral presentation of the Word of God instead of a written presentation. And um, they also had another element, which was a teaching authority. Jesus had determined that he wanted uh, at least some people, not everybody, but at least some people to be able to teach authoritatively in his name. And so he invested the church with a teaching authority that was originally exercised by the Twelve Apostles and later, uh, you know, by uh, additional people like St. Paul and who and St. Barnabas, who were apostles but not members of the Twelve. And he even wished that this teaching authority, the Latin term for which is magisterium, from the Latin word magister, which means teacher, this teaching authority or magisterium would exercise its decision-making process in certain ways. For example, St. Paul says in Galatians that the council that was held in Acts 15, this was the year AD 49, was prompted by the Holy Spirit. He says he went up to Jerusalem by way of revelation for this council. And so this council has been uh, authorized by the Holy Spirit. And at the council, the, the question they're trying to settle is, are Gentiles required to become Jews in order to be Christians? Or can you be saved as a Christian even though you're not circumcised? And what they do is they review the evidence. They're not getting a new revelation at this council. You know, the Holy Spirit does not speak from above and tell them the answer. Instead, they review the evidence that they've already accumulated, and they appeal partly to Scripture, but they also appeal to tradition. You know, Peter recounts things, experiences that he's had. Paul and Barnabas recount experiences that they've had. These are not written in Scripture. You know, they weren't at the time anyway. And so this is this is an oral proclamation of here's what we've learned in the past. So this is oral tradition. And they end up uh, formulating a solution where they say, okay, 
based on the evidence, Gentiles do not have to become Jews in order to be saved. But we also want Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians to be able to live together in a harmonious way. And so they come up with some pastoral provisions um, to regulate the relationship. And they announce those in a letter, and they say, again, appealing to the Holy Spirit, they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that you guys follow the following guidelines. And so what we see here is an exercise of teaching authority backed by the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit did not intervene directly and give new revelation, but he guided them in their interpretation of the existing revelation of Scripture and tradition. And so that's what we see in this case, the teaching authority doing, the magisterium doing. It's not getting new revelation, but it's being guided by God in its understanding and application of Scripture and tradition. So that's the apostolic paradigm. The apostles recognized the authority of Scripture, and they recognized the authority of apostolic tradition, not Pharisaic tradition, but Christian apostolic tradition, and they recognized a teaching authority in the church or magisterium that does not itself get revelation, but is able to authoritatively interpret, guided by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God as found in Scripture and tradition. So that's the paradigm that the apostles used. And you know what happened when the apostles died? Christians said, let's keep using it. So if it was good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for us. So uh, when the apostles died, the they left in charge the bishops of the church, the episcopacy, even though the term bishop and presbyter or priest were um, used interchangeably in the 80s, 60s, by the end of the first century, there had come to be a distinction between the two offices, with the bishop being the higher office. And we know that because um, Ignatius of Antioch at the beginning of the second century is talking to church, multiple churches, and he talks frequently about the threefold ministries of bishop, priest, and deacon. And he says, you got to have a bishop or you're not even a church. So this is a widespread, already received thing that the apostles had put in place before the end of the apostolic age. And the bishops are now the highest teachers in the church. So the authority to teach when the apostles died devolved upon the bishops, and they became the magisterium of the church. And so down through history, Catholics have recognized uh, from the first century onward that the Word of God is found exclusively in Scripture and tradition, and the magisterium is the authorized authoritative interpreter of that tradition as guided by the Holy Spirit. So we're just continuing to use the apostolic paradigm. Yeah, and, and I'll say, very well said, Jimmy, and thank you for that that, that wonderfully said summary. <laughs> I, I'll say that for me, discovering this as evangelical was, was earth-shattering, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that that is how things were done, that carried on and carries on to today. Now, I, I guess, and I wanna be charitable and fair to the Protestant argument, I guess the Protestant claim that Scripture is the sole infallible rule of, of faith and morals has to reject the claim, one of those claims, right, that, that the apostles passed on that authority or that the magisterium was an office that existed or that there were traditions that aren't found in the Bible that were passed on. I guess the, the claim has to – has to say, okay, sure, maybe maybe soul scripture isn't isn't found explicitly or implicitly in the Bible, okay, mm -hmm. but still, it's the only rule of faith that we can reliably trust because the only thing we have, you know, left over from when Christ and the apostles taught, is is scripture. That's God's word. Mm -hmm. There's no other tradition. There's no authority. All we have is scripture. So that so that must be the the sole thing to appeal to. And you know, traditions can help. Right, like Christians, like the, the, like the Trinity are, are helpful things to inherit as Christians, but ultimately, if we're testing all these things, are tested against Scripture as the kind of the, the court of final appeal. How would you res respond to it to a claim like that? Well, to steel man the Protestant position, I mean, you said a number of things, wrote, kind of in quick succession there, and if I were arguing for the Protestant position, I would want to introduce a few qualifiers. Um, the one being that, okay, uh, tradition, and by that I mean 
apostolic tradition um, is not necessarily, first of all, it's not necessarily things that aren't written in the Bible. Um, because the when the apostles handed on their teachings to the church, they didn't say, okay, let's write down some of them and we'll hand those on. And then we'll talk about totally different stuff orally. You know, so they would, so you'll find apostolic tradition that was handed on to the church in scripture, but a, a lot of it, some people would say even all of it, although that's not my view, um, is also found in oral tradition. So you'll have baptism mentioned in scripture, for example, but the apostles also orally preached about baptism. And so you have these two ways in which um, the word of God is passed on to us. And it has been, there's never been a gap in Christian history where Christians forgot all about baptism and then rediscovered it by reading the Bible. You know, it's always been orally preached alongside scripture. So we shouldn't view apostolic tradition as something that's entirely separate from Scripture, although or that it requires things that aren't mentioned in Scripture. It can be something passed down alongside Scripture that clarifies things that are mentioned in Scripture. Like, for example, the mode of baptism. As I'm sure you know, as a former Protestant, there are there intense debates at times in the Protestant community about what is the proper mode of baptism. Do you have to be immersed? Is it okay to pour? What about sprinkling? Um, and the New Testament never answers those questions. And so in these debates, you get very detailed arguments about well, like, what's the exact shading of this, the meaning of this Greek term? And what about this biblical image? What does it tell us about the mode of baptism? You know, can we look at the Holy Spirit being poured out on Pentecost as a sign that po baptismal pouring is okay? But Scripture never answers these questions because it's not an instruction manual for how to become a Christian. The audience of the New Testament were already Christians. They knew how you baptized people because they'd seen it. They had had it happen to them themselves. So the New Testament expects you to look to the tradition of the church, not to Scripture, to tell you the answer for things like, how do you get baptized? And when we look at extra writings outside of the New Testament, they some of them are, how, here's how to become a Christian, and they answer this question. If you look in the Didache, which is a document that in its earliest form was probably written around AD 50. So contemporaneous with, say, the Gospel of Mark, maybe even earlier than the Gospel of Mark, it says, okay, here's how you baptize. Number one, uh, if you can, baptize in, um, in cold water. Number two, if you can't baptize in cold water, then baptize in, in warm running water. And if you don't have either of those, pour water over the head three times. So that indicates there's not a single mode of baptism that was considered acceptable in first century Christianity. There were multiple modes, and pouring was one of them. So, um, so that's an example of how a tradition passed on outside of the New Testament can shed light on something in the New Testament. And I would say that that statement in the Didache, it may not be in the words of the apostles, but it's an apostolic tradition. And so I think we do have apostolic traditions today. It's not the case that they've all just vanished. Um, the next qualification I would make if I were arguing for the Protestant position is I, I would say, well, traditions are helpful. They can be helpful. They're just not infallible. And the same thing for the magisterium. The magisterium is helpful and it can be authoritative. It just isn't capable of teaching infallibly. And so if the if what we have of apostolic tradition is not infallible, if we don't have infallible knowledge of apostolic tradition, then we have to regard tradition as non-infallible. And, and if the magisterium is not infallible, then that leaves us with Scripture as the only infallible rule for our faith. Um, now, I don't think those arguments are successful, but that's how I would steel man the position. Yeah. Now, what one of the pushbacks against, say, the the, the Catholic perspective is that traditions, uh, they're they're nebulous in that you can't necessarily point to exactly where they are because they're not they're not say written down. 
You can't say well, not in scripture. Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and they can they can change. You know, one of the arguments that's that's recently been brought up against sola scriptura in a number of places that is that traditions can can change. Uh, and the 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 example of the death penalty, for example, is brought up. The Catholic Church people, you know, has been claimed to now have changed the position on capital punishment. This was a tradition, and now it's been changed. And so, the, the argument from Protestants, and I and I guess, I mean, there, there's a nervousness around this. If we believe this tradition, and it can change, how can we call traditions infallible? How would you argue with the infallibility of traditions when we seem to see, or Protestants seem to see, traditions? In the Catholic Church changing. Okay, so let me talk about the principles that are involved, and then I'll move to the particular example of the death penalty that's been brought up recently. The The reason that I don't think the steel man version of the Protestant case that I just made is successful is because I think we are capable of having infallible knowledge of apostolic tradition. I think the traditions and, and are, are there They have been passed down. We still have them, like we've got that statement in the Didache. And I think a thoughtful uh, Protestant would agree that, okay, yeah, we've got this first century statement. It's coming from the first century Christian community. It's consistent with what we see later in Christianity. That looks like an apostolic tradition. And they could, on probabilistic grounds, say, okay, I think we do have an apostolic tradition of information that is not found in Scripture. It may be reflected in Scripture because Scripture talks about baptism, but the details of acceptable modes of baptism are not found in Scripture, and it is found here. So I think that um, given the, the, the age and context of the Didache's statement on the modes of baptism, that thoughtful Protestants could agree that, okay, it looks like we've got an apostolic tradition here. The problem is we have other um, competing ideas on a variety of subjects, not baptism in particular, but on a variety of subjects, we have different competing ideas, uh, some of which are very early, some of which are later, and they're sometimes regarded by their advocates as having come to us from the apostles, and not all of those claims are true. So the problem isn't so much do we have apostolic traditions as how do we distinguish between apostolic traditions and non-apostolic traditions. And that's the job of the magisterium. That's exactly what we saw the magisterium do in Acts 15, where you had these competing traditions in the first century Christian community. You had individuals like Paul and Barnabas and Peter, who did not have a problem baptizing Gentiles into the faith. But then you had other people not James himself, but people who were affiliated with James in some way, who said, not you got to be circumcised if you want to be saved. So we had two competing traditions in the apostolic community. And what the council did was it met and it resolved which of these traditions is accurate. And that's what the magisterium continued to do later in church history. That's how we got the canon of scripture. Um, you know, you, the apostles wrote certain books that were genuinely scripture and handed on to the churches, but other people wrote books too. And some of them were such that people would look at them and think, hey, this ought to be, this should, we should consider this scripture. An example of that is the shepherd of Hermas. Uh, Hermas was a former slave in Rome who became a Christian, and he received a whole bunch of private revelations, which he then wrote about. Hermas also appears to be mentioned in the New Testament. He seems to be the Hermas that's mentioned at the end of the book of Romans. So that would make him an associate of apostles, just like Mark and Luke are, and their books are scripture. So people would say, hey, we've got this shepherd book by Hermas. He's an associate of apostles, and this is a book of revelations. So this should be scripture, you know. And and there were people in the early church who thought that sh- her, that the shepherd needed to be part of scripture. There also was doubt about some of the books that are in the New Testament. Um, there was doubt about Second Peter. There was doubt about Second and Third John. There was doubt about Hebrews. You know, Hebrews doesn't even name its author. How do how how do we know this guy was an apostle 
or an associate of an apostle. And so you had some people who say, I don't think that belongs in Scripture. And because the Church is not using sola scriptura, the Church could live with this situation of not having total certainty about the canon of Scripture. Because if you've got an magisterium to appeal to, the question of settling the canon is not urgent. It, there can be some doubt about its exact boundaries, because if there's ever a crisis, like, is this a heresy or not, the magisterium can review the data and arrive at a correct conclusion about the about the answer to, is this thing a heresy or not? So you don't need to have a precise understanding of the boundaries of Scripture, and for centuries the Church didn't. If you if you look, for example, at the writings of Ignatius or sorry, Eusebius of Caesarea around 325, he has a list in his ecclesiastical history of books related to the canon. He divides them into three classes. He says, okay, there are some of these books like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Everybody agrees that's scripture. And then there are certain books like the Gnostic Gospels, and he says, everybody agrees that's not scripture at least all Orthodox Christians. and But then he says, then there's this middle group of disputed books, and it includes some books that are in the New Testament, and it includes some books that are not in the New Testament. So Christians were still debating this in the early 300s. By the end of the 300s, you had events like, you had local councils like the Council of Rome, the Council of Hippo, one of the councils of Carthage, and they non-infallibly, but nevertheless, issued canon lists, which are identical to the Catholic canon of today. And what the magisterium did in those cases, just like it looked at the existing traditions about do you have to be a Jew or not, they looked at the existing traditions regarding is this book scripture or not. And um, they appealed, in fact, to tradition in two ways. The first one was, in the case of a given book, is there a tradition of it being read in the liturgy in the churches as Scripture? So that's one way they appeal to tradition, to support books as, yes, if there's a tradition that widespread churches have been using this book in their liturgies as Scripture, that's evidence it is Scripture. The other thing, that, whereas if a book just came out of nowhere— they would say, uh-uh, no, there's no tradition of this book being received by the Christian community. I don't care who it says it was written by. It's a fake. Then the other way they would appeal to tradition is, does a work um, contradict the tradition of the apostles that's been handed down to us? Does it agree with Christian doctrine or not, or does it contradict it? So if you find a, new, a document, it says, oh, it says it's written by the apostle John, but it says... Jesus is an eon that emerged. He's not the Son of God. He's an eon that emerged from a group of about 33 eons in order to rescue us from this evil world that was made by an evil God, or at least a severely broken God. Um, then you can say, okay, that disagrees with, with the tradition we've received from the apostles. That's not Christian teaching. This is not Scripture. This is a Gnostic gospel. It's a fake. And so by reviewing the evidence of tradition, not of Scripture, they didn't say, oh, let's look in our Bibles and find the magical table of contents that doesn't exist. They reviewed tradition to then establish the canon of Scripture. And if you're, and later the church infallibly confirmed this, but if you're a Protestant and you say, yeah, these 27 books are the ones for the New Testament and there aren't any others, you got to say that God infallibly guided the church in this. I mean, he's clearly guiding the church. And if they didn't make a mistake, then under God's guidance, they arrived at a decision that has no error. It looks like God protected them from error. And that would mean, if you're protected from error, that means you're teaching something infallibly. That's what infallible means, is not, not having the possibility of error. And so um, it looks like the magisterium is able, centuries after the time of the apostles, to review the data 
and arrive at a conclusion that God has guaranteed to be true, and thus one that's infallible. So I think we can have infallible knowledge of what whether something is or isn't apostolic tradition. Now, that's a separate question than the application of tradition to particular circumstances. And, and so we can, we can delve into the death penalty here. Um, the church historically has understood, based on Scripture, that there are situations in which the death penalty can be used. And that's, that's fine. The church has not said that that's not the case. Recently, there has been a trajectory beginning with John Paul II and becoming more robust under uh, Benedict XVI and under Pope Francis that wants to see the death penalty not used today. John Paul II, for example, said even though the, the church has recognized its legitimacy, um, we don't need it today because of our improved penal system where we can keep people locked up. And they didn't have long-term prisons in the ancient world. You know, the idea in the ancient world was, why should I support someone? We're all star half-starving anyway. Why should we support someone for the rest of their life for free in a cage? You, you wanted to deal justice quickly. So once you determined that someone was guilty and needed to be punished, you punished them immediately. You, you might find them if they were worthy of a fine. You might physically discipline them if it was worthy of physical discipline. But if they'd done something so severe that you couldn't let them run free anymore, well, then you just killed them. And you did that because you didn't have a prison. You didn't have a developed economy to sustain a prison system where you would keep people alive in a cage for decades. And so um, capital punishment made all the sense in the world. But today we have a developed economy where you can put hardened criminals in prison indefinitely without bankrupting the state and causing people to starve. So um, John Paul II's argument was that we don't need this anymore, and therefore it's better to not use it because it you, this way, you know, and you can spin various arguments like this way they get more of a chance to repent and so forth. That's all that's debatable. But that was his argument. He wasn't saying the death penalty was wrong, but that it shouldn't be used today. And that's Pope Francis hasn't done anything that fundamentally changes that. He's carefully avoided using language that would imply that the death penalty was never acceptable. Instead, he said it is inadmissible, not it always has been inadmissible. He, the language is it is inadmissible given these various factors. And so um, whether you agree with him or not, he what he's doing is applying um, the current social situation to this question where, for example, we, we do have long-term prisons that we can afford, and he hasn't said that it was never acceptable. And the and he furthermore hasn't he hasn't taught that infallibly. So even if you disagree with him, and even if he came out and said it was never acceptable, well, okay, as long as he hasn't said that infallibly, we don't have any contradiction here. He could just be mistaken. Churchmen can make mistakes in their teaching. Uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1990 acknowledged, yeah, non-infallible teaching is non-infallible. Duh. So, um, so it's not like the magisterium never makes mistakes. Uh, they noted in particular the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith did. Today it's called the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, but it's the same body. They, uh, they noted that particularly in prudential decisions, like should we have the death penalty or not, there was room for debate and, and bishops don't always take everything into account and, and could make mistakes. So even if, you, even if you totally disagree with Pope Francis on this, and even if he were to come out and say it was never acceptable, well, okay, then he'd be wrong. But we don't have, he ha he's not trying to engage his infallibility and it would be a straw man to try to take a statement that is 
non-infallible and treat it as, oh, that's infallible and we've got a contradiction. Uh, no, we don't. The Catholic Church doesn't claim that this is infallible, and so you can't use it to generate a, con an, a contradiction between infallible statements. If if you've got an infallible conclusion that the death penalty at least used to be okay, and you've got a new statement that's non-infallible and denies that, then you the logical inference would not be the apostolic paradigm is wrong. The the logical conclusion would be the new statement is wrong. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. That's a very good point. One of the things that that uh, criticisms that you'll see in different places and in, in debates and discussions are appeals to the church fathers. And one of the one of the quotes I think is relevant here comes from Augustine writing to Donatist, and he says a bunch of things. One of the things, and I, I think often quoted out of context, one of the things he mentions is that. And this, again, goes to the idea that there is no other infallible rule, and there can't be, because he mentions how there are plenary councils, but they can be they can be amended or corrected, that word can be translated either way, mm -hmm. uh, by later councils when new things come to light. And this is this is used to show that even, look, even Augustine didn't believe there was an, any other infallible rules other than scripture, because here's an example of, say, the magisterium or the tradition of the apostles passed on in the council that can correct itself later on. How would you, you I mean, I can think of ways I'd push back on that. Mm -hmm. How would you push back against an argument like that that says, look, here's a church father saying that this thing isn't infallible? Well, okay, he didn't say he, he didn't say councils are never infallible, regardless of which way you translate it, whether you translate it as amended or corrected. And I'd want to know what the Latin word is and do a Latin word study before yeah, commenting, it's a, which it's a mendo. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd still want to do a Latin word study before yeah. before making firm conclusions, but um, I would say that that he's expressing an aspect of the current Catholic position. Councils are not always infallible. Um, they they can make mistakes and sometimes have made mistakes, which were later corrected when they were teaching non infallibly, and even when they teach infallibly, they can be supplemented by later teaching. And so I would say, you know, I don't have the Augustine quote in front of me, but based on your summary of it, um, it sounds to me like he's expressing what the Catholic Church teaches today. And so I don't think that's a good text, at least from what I've heard, uh, for attacking the Catholic position, because the Catholic position incorporates the insights that Augustine was expressing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess to the pushback that I, I would often suggest with, is that it's a church father it's not he alone is not either also an infallible authority yeah on what we he, he's he, he's not he is a member of the magisterium because he's a bishop yeah. but but he, he's not he's not himself infallible he's not claiming to speak infallibly but but i think what he's saying is not even wrong yeah. it is yeah. part of the catholic position yeah yeah and it would thus be a straw man to try to pit that quote against the catholic position yeah absolutely so I think one of the most interesting things, and, and we kind of maybe hinted at this a bit earlier, it, just looking at the when the ca the canon of the Bible was actually really kind of uh, officially began to be codified centuries mm -hmm. after Jesus and the apostles. But the, the question of when when did sola scriptura begin, I think it's a really interesting question to unpack because that, again, then begins to raise questions about how this is a, a workable system based on when it would have possibly began. So mm -hmm. what would... What, what do you say about in terms of how to address that when, if this is the rule of faith of Christians, when would it have had to begin to make, it well, make sense? Well, so the, um, you, you'll encounter a wide variety of claims on this. Um, I mean, you will find people who will want to say, oh, the apostles used Sola Scriptura, and that's clearly false. Um, it was, it was not, the paradigm in the apostolic age, and you'll find some more thoughtful people who will say, well, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what the apostles were doing, but it's what we need to do now. And you'll find some people who will even say, as long as a clear memory of the apostolic traditions persisted, people wouldn't have been using Sola Scriptura. So it's an emergent phenomenon that happened sometime after the apostolic age, but may, they weren't using it necessarily in the year 200 or 300, but later they did in the patristic age. Well, um, 
you'll find additional thoughtful people who will say, yeah, no, it's really not there in the patristic age. Um, you'll, you can find some quotations that certainly talk highly about scripture, but when you look at other things the same authors said, it's clear they're not relying just on scripture, and they're not conceptualizing this as a as scripture is our only infallible rule, or that scripture is our only sufficient rule that must be used for all of Christian doctrine. They just they just don't they're not thinking in those terms. So this is a much later development. Now, given the size of the Christian community and the fact it's been around for 2,000 years, it's very hard to point to a single individual and say, this guy is the one that first came up with the idea of sola scriptura or the sufficiency of scripture. Um, I think that um, there probably were early antecedents where somebody who had a beef with the church, you know, said, I'm just going to read scripture alone. Okay, there were probably people who did that, but they weren't very many of them because most people, there was no movement like that until the rise of Protestantism. And there's a simple reason for that, which is most people, even if they had a beef with the church, didn't have scriptures. Because for most of Christian history, for the first three quarters of Christian history, there was no printing press. And that meant that every copy of Scripture had to be hand copied. And since they didn't have industrial paper mills, even the individual pages on which Scripture were, were written had to be handmade either from papyrus which involves which is a reed that is found in Egypt and there's this whole complex process of how you how you treat papyrus and knit it together to make paper or parchment which is animal skins so you got to grow the animal then you got to kill the animal then you got to take off its skin then you got to treat the skin until eventually you get a piece of parchment out of it and so books between the paper costs and the ink costs and the scribal costs were fantastically expensive. Um, and that was true in the age when the New Testament was written. If you had a single copy of the Gospel of Matthew, it had to be handmade. And between the scribal, and there have been estimates, including by Protestant scholars like Randolph Richards, of what would it have cost in modern terms to get a copy of Matthew and or copies of Paul's epistles? And the answer is a single copy of the Gospel of Matthew would have cost you more than $2,200, so more than $2,000 for just Matthew. And, you know, if you wanted a whole Bible, it would take a scribe, you know, most of a year to produce that. So most people were living hand to mouth and they didn't have the money for scriptures. The only people who had money for scriptures were rich people and institutions where people pooled their resources to be able to afford them, institutions like churches and monasteries. But unless you were at a unless you were at a monastery or unless you were filthy rich, you didn't have the scriptures. And that didn't really change until the mid-1400s, when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press. And all of a sudden, we, we don't need to pay scribes anymore. We can mass-produce copies of this book. And of course, the Bible was one of the first yeah. books that was, that was printed. And all of us, so what this does, you're cutting out all those scribal costs, and by this point, they had better ways of making paper. Like after the Black Death, they would take all that used clothing that the dead people didn't need anymore, and they'd soak it in water and boil it down and then press it out and make pulp fiber out of that to make paper. So the material costs were coming down too. And, um, and all of a sudden, you don't have to be filthy rich to afford scriptures anymore. You could just merely be upper middle class 
And so upper middle class people started getting their hands on scriptures. And it was so exciting. I can read it for myself whenever I want. I can look stuff up. I don't have to wait for them to read it to me in church. I can, I can, I can do this myself. And it's no wonder that it was 60 years after the invention of the printing press that you first have the beginnings of the Protestant movement talking about Sola Scriptura, because you had all these upper middle class people who suddenly, like the reformers, who suddenly had personal copies of scripture, they were they were excited out of their minds. It's like, hey, we've got a beef with the church. We've got these scriptures. Let's just use that. <laughs> That's a fantastic retelling. I appreciate that to me. That, that leads into the, the logical question then of, of Sola Scriptura then, because if if this was the, the system that God has designed, the scriptures being the sole infallible rule of, of for Christian faith and morals, it really could not e exist prior to people being able to actually read the scriptures, right? Well, it, no, it, it could exist. It just is. It, it just couldn't be implemented. Right. So what we can say with confidence is it was not God's, this idea of, you hear pastors saying, don't believe me, read the Bible for yourself, make your own decisions. That could never have been implemented prior to the invention of the printing press and widespread literacy, because, you know, in the ancient world, you know, yeah, 10, yeah. 10 percent of people could read. So it couldn't have been implemented. And the fact it couldn't have been implemented means it wasn't God's plan for the average Christian. And that remained true for three quarters of church history. This could not have been God's plan from the beginning. And if we look to the beginning of when the church was set up, how did God set it up? What plan did he expect people to use? It was the apostolic paradigm. And so the apostolic paradigm should still be used. I also want to comment. So, uh, you know, we've been, I've already mentioned how the sufficiency of scripture is problematic because it, it's, it's self-refuting. You know, it's not mentioned in scripture. But if you believe in the sufficiency of scripture, then even if you separate Sola Scriptura and say, all this means is it's our only infallible rule of faith, period, you're going to need to prove that from Scripture alone. If you believe in Sola Scriptura, in the sufficiency of Scripture, you've still got to prove Sola Scriptura from Scripture alone. So how are you going to get the idea that Scripture is our only infallible rule of faith out of Scripture alone? It doesn't look promising, because even though Jesus is critical of some traditions, like the traditions of the Pharisees, he's not critical of apostolic tradition. And the apostles, like Paul, clearly consider apostolic tradition to be reliable and binding and an expression of the Word of God, so it's infallible. Jesus also never criticized—he may criticize Jewish ruling authorities— he never criticizes the magisterium he set up in the church. He never says, this is a fallible magisterium I'm setting up. Um, and so, and the evidence we have of the Holy Spirit guiding the magisterium into making correct decisions, including the one in Acts 15, in, is, is consistent with the apostolic paradigm as understood by Catholics. So I don't think you can find passages in Scripture that teach sola scriptura, even on the restricted definition. What happens in discussions, and I've seen this happen in debates. I mean, I saw recently Gavin Ortland had a debate with Trent Horn, and Gavin was doing this, what I'm about to describe, in the debate. It's like, well, this is all we got. We can agree Scripture is infallible. We agree to that, but we don't have infallible tradition or an infallible magisterium. Therefore, Scripture is all we got. Okay, um, you can assert that, but asserting it doesn't make it true. And if you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, you're going to need to show from Scripture explicitly or implicitly, not that some traditions like Pharisaical ones are, are fallible. You're going to need to show that all traditions are fallible. And you can't do that. You're also going to need to show not not that some teachers like the 
like the Jewish Sanhedrin, let's say, are fallible, you're going to need to show that all teachers are fallible. So we we don't have and, and have no possibility of having an infallible tradition that can be identified infallibly by a magisterium. And there, there are there are no passages that state or imply that. And so I think that even on the restricted understanding of sola scriptura as it's our only infallible rule of faith, it fails the sufficiency of scripture test. Yeah, and in your sense, you're you're assuming that there are no other infallible rules of faith, but 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 that's an an assumption that you're you're making that the Bible does not tell you. Yeah, right? and that's and essential. there there are other things. Now, I said I mentioned that some uh, people would say that everything that's in Scripture. Now there there are a couple of moves that. Well, okay, there. Two things I want to mention. The first one is a common move, um, and Gavin did gesture in this direction in the recent debate, although he's not the first to do it. I remember back when I was an evangelical and starting to question Sola Scriptura, I talked to a friend of mine who was a minister in the Presbyterian Church in America, and I said, how do we prove Sola Scriptura from Scripture alone? And he said the same essential thing which Gavin said in the recent debate— well, it's not really a teaching. It's more like a presupposition that we make to get our theology going. And Gavin said something similar. I think he used the word like prolegominal, prolegomenon or prolegominal matter, something like that. And so what this move is, regardless of who makes it, they're trying to take, because they, they recognize sola scriptura cannot be proved, even on the restricted definition, it can't be proved from scripture alone. They're trying to take it out of the category of teachings so that sufficiency of Scripture, which says you, you've got to prove all Scripture, all teachings from Scripture. Well, this isn't a teaching. This is something else. It's not really a doctrine. It's a presupposition or a prolegomenon to doctrine or something like that, to which my answer would be a, a term that I shouldn't use on a family-friendly a family -friendly program. <laughs> But um, and so I won't. But nonsense. It's clearly a teaching. You're teaching your congregations that Scripture is our only infallible rule of faith. That's a teaching, and you can't just and or oh, and you're teaching sufficiency of Scripture. That's a teaching. If you got to prove all teachings from Scripture, you're going to have to prove these teachings, and creatively mislabeling them as something other than teachings is not going to help your case. If we get to just introduce out of nowhere our own presuppositions or prolegomena based on how things seem to us, well then, oh, guess what? Mormons are perfectly justified saying that um, that uh, the Book of Mormon is Scripture, and Jehovah's Witnesses are perfectly justified saying the Scripture has to be interpreted by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. That's not a teaching. That's one of our presuppositions. It's a prolegomenon that allows us to do correct theology. Nonsense. Anybody can introduce anything they want as a prolegomenon or presupposition. I, if, if you want to claim that, you need evidence for it. And in this case, you need, if sufficiency of Scripture is true, you need evidence from Scripture alone, and you ain't got it. <laughs> well said, and appreciate it. Keep it family-friendly, <laughs> Jimmy. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Nonsense will do. It took me a moment to get there, yeah, but yeah. Good. That'll do. The, the last thing I want to address, I guess, the heart of this, and this is, I mean, it's kind of a, a weird agnostic approach to Christian unity, and mm -hmm. it kind of goes along the lines of, well, the Bible is all we got for infallibility, so it's all we have to unite around. So as Christians, we have the Bible to kind of to, to rally around, and it's not perfect, but it's all God left us with. And so that's how we'll identify as Christians, as these people who who believe the Bible, and that's our, that's our rallying cry. That, for me, and I know for you too, was mm -hmm. insufficient. Mm -hmm. It didn't, you know, logically, you see divisions, you see d debate over interpretations, and that's what kind of drove me to looking deeper into the Catholic faith. But mm -hmm. this is the common kind of approach of, of Protestant Christians is we, this is what we have. This is maybe not the best thing we have, but it's all we got, so we'll, we'll just kind of tr try our best. I would argue, 
there are other mm-hmm. things to, to unite around as mm-hmm. Christians other than the Bible. Yeah. Or maybe the, the Pope, maybe. <laughs> well, how would you push back on an argument like that? This is the Bible's all we got. So it's not perfect, you know, in terms of the, there'll be different interpretations, different arguments, but it's the best we can do. So we'll give it a go. Um, well, I think so. What we're talking about is ecumenism. And ecumenism or promoting positive relations between Christians is a good thing, um, and we should work towards it, but we can't falsify the truth in the process of working for greater unity. Um, the same argument would that, that you just used, um, well, number one, ecumenism cannot be the determiner of our doctrine. Instead, ecumenism must take place within the framework of doctrine. So just because something would be ecumenically useful doesn't mean you can jettison doctrines in the service of ecumenism. Um, Because, hey, we could reunite with bunches of people if we denied that Jesus is the son of God. You know, we could, hey, guess what? We can merge Christianity and Islam if we do that. Um, so, So you can't do ecumenism you can't subordinate doctrine to ecumenism and um and catholics can do ecumenism with people who recognize more than more than scripture we've got robust dialogues with the uh, with the eastern orthodox and the oriental orthodox who recognize tradition just like we do and they recognize in principle magisteriums so um so it's really the protestant community that's limited itself to scripture alone. And um, and you won't get a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox saying scripture is our only infallible rule. That's not our understanding of things. That's a Protestant understanding. And if Protestants hold to that, then it looks to me like full union is not going to be possible with them. That doesn't mean we can't work together in other ways, like, for example, um, you know, in the pro-life movement, you know, the 1973 Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade forced Catholics and Protestants here in America to work together and get to know each other in a way that hadn't been the case before widespread abortion. So we can continue to work together and have unity on matters like that. But um, nobody should be in a position of saying, well, my group has restricted itself to just this, therefore, you need to subordinate your doctrine in order to agree with me, because if you admit that as a principle, then um, then anybody could take a minimalist position and exclude all kinds of things. You could have people who say, you know, I, I don't think the Old Testament should have anything to say to Christians. It's all, I mean, you could have hyper uh, dispensationalists who want to say even most of the New Testament, yeah, it's not for us. All we can really agree upon are these little passages in the uh, in the pastoral letters. That's what's relevant to governing our Christian lives today. Is just these very few passages, just a few verses. That's all I'm asking. Just recognize these verses. But that's all we can unite around as binding on us. So none of us, for the sake of for the sake of fellowship, we should all agree on what we can agree on, which is these few verses in in the pastoral epistles. Those govern the Christian life and not all of that other stuff. Well, Protestants themselves, the vast majority of them would say, sorry, no, I think the entire New Testament is directly relevant to the Christian life and the Old Testament is indirectly relevant. And we can't just dismiss everything prior to the pastoral epistles as that was for another age. That's not for us. So and and so I I don't think that the ecumenical argument for sola scriptura here is particularly good. Now, since we agree on scripture, at least most of it, um, we can make common cause on those grounds, but that doesn't get us to a doctrine of sola scriptura. And I I'm not surprised I haven't really heard Protestant apologists advancing this as an argument. Yeah, and I'm thinking just mm-hmm. I mean you hit this too, and I'm sure I, I, I'm sure you hit this. I I hit into this as I was looking into. Mm-hmm to how to solve issues of scriptural interpretation. If we're looking at what Christ intended the church to look like in, in, you know, how, in, in John seven, John 17, when Christ prays mm-hmm. for the unity of the church, 
I could not determine how we could under Sola Scriptura with the Bible as the sole rule and different interpretations and different denominations ever figured out how we ever could be united like that if the only thing we had in common was the Bible. When I then saw the Catholic faith with something like like the Pope, a teaching office that has authority to say who's in and who's out, that felt to me like a way we could be united as Christians mm-hmm. versus a Bible that we're interpreting for ourselves. Did that, did that, was that weighty for you in, in your, in your journey? I don't think so. Uh, not in my case. I, okay. I recognized that, I mean, I, I, after I recognized that Sola Scripture was false, I essentially had to choose, okay, so I do, do I become Catholic or Orthodox? And the, the question there did involve thinking about the Pope and his role in the Christian community. Um, but it, it wasn't so much for practical reasons. Um, also, so there are Catholic apologists who have argued like one of the fatal flaws of Sola Scriptura is it's unworkable because you don't have an interactive, uh, source that you can go to and get clarification on. Whereas we do with the magisterium, if there's a crisis, the magisterium can address it. So it responds interactively to changing historical circumstance. And that is a benefit. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a good thing. And, 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 and that's why God gave us the magisterium. That's why the Acts 15 Council happened. Um, so it is a benefit, but I don't tend to argue Sola Scriptura is false because it's unworkable and leads to division. I may note in passing that it leads to division because you don't have an authoritative source that's interactive, like the magisterium. But to me, the problems with Sola Scriptura run deeper than that. Um, Under sufficiency of Scripture, whether you combine them or separate them, Sola Scriptura is falsified by that. And it is not the apostolic paradigm. And unless you can find a, if the apostles taught their, you know, congregations, this apostolic paradigm, this is what, this is how we do Christian doctrine. If they were teaching them this paradigm, then if sufficiency of scripture is true, you're going to need to find passages that imply that after the apostolic age, we're going to have a new paradigm. It's going to shift. You're not supposed to keep using the apostolic paradigm. And there are no such passages. There are barely any passages in the New Testament. I mean, maybe three that even envision a post-apostolic age, and they don't give instructions for how to uh, do Christian doctrine in a different way. In fact, in 2 Timothy, which is one of the books that does envision a post-apostolic age, because Paul is about to die and he knows it. In that, he's giving Timothy instructions about how to do Christian teaching in the future. And so he's envisioning the post-apostolic age, but he doesn't say, look to Scripture alone. Instead, he says, take what you he makes an appeal to tradition. He says, take what you heard from me, so that's oral tradition, and you teach it to competent men who are trustworthy and will teach it to others. So he's envisioning the passing on of apostolic tradition in the post-apostolic age as being the thing that he wants Timothy to be concerned about. He's not advocating sola scriptura. He's advocating a continued use of tradition in the post-apostolic age. (laughs) <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, Jimmy, we can go on for a long time, but we'll mm-hmm. leave it there. And I'll thank you for being uh, on the show and for sharing uh, this discussion with me and with our listeners for our 200th episode. I'm glad, glad Yay! You. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Where do you want to point listeners towards? I don't know, other resources that you've written, mm-hmm. uh, books, uh, places they can go to find more uh, more from you. Where do you want to point them towards? Uh, Okay, so as you mentioned, I'm senior apologist at Catholic Answers, been working there as of this June for 30 years, and our website is catholic.com. I've written a bunch about this. You can also find stuff I've written, including about Sola Scriptura and some of the problems with it, like the practical ones I mentioned, you know, printing press and so forth. At my personal website, jimmyakin.com, there's also a book that I wrote called The Bible is a Catholic Book, in which I 
do discuss Sola Scriptura in the broader framework of biblical history and how we get from the dawn of mankind to now in terms of God's revelation. And even though the book isn't exclusively about Sola Scriptura, it sets Sola Scriptura in a larger framework that I think is very helpful for people to understand. So I would recommend getting a copy of The Bible is a Catholic Book. Um, that's also available as an audiobook. And um, then, uh, of course, I, you also mentioned I do uh, Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Uh, we're a top 20 podcast in the documentary category on Apple Podcasts. We've got over 100,000 listeners. Every Friday, we look at a new mystery from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. They can be historical mysteries, scientific mysteries, religious mysteries, a little bit of true crime, um, paranormal mysteries, all kinds of interesting stuff. So you can go to mysterious.fm for uh, to find the site. It's also in all the standard podcast directories, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all those. And you can watch the video version of the podcast right here on YouTube. Um, my channel is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And so I'd encourage you, now that we're finishing up this broadcast, head over to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken and check out some episodes. And also, uh, I am trying to grow my channel, so I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notification while you're there. Fantastic stuff, Jimmy. Uh, two things. That book, Bible is a Catholic book, is fantastic. I had it in the show years ago when it first came out, Jimmy. And I said, I said, that, I said this then. I'll say it again now. It's just so concise. It's straightforward. It's thorough. It's just fantastic. You did a fantastic job with, with that book, Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, and the podcast is wonderful. It's been about an hour or two late lately. I'll talk to Dom about this, Jimmy. <laughs> it's not so much. Well, we changed the release time on YouTube. Well, there you go. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'll i tell you what, the, the couple of hours there makes a big difference. I've been looking forward to it at, so much so that when it's late by an hour or two, I'm like, come on, guys. Where, where is it? Where is it? It, it ruins my whole day. So, oh, so thanks well, for a fantastic uh, show. And <laughs> thank you. Unfortunately, in order to reach people on YouTube, you've got to comply with the YouTube algorithm yeah. and when it wants to do things. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Jimmy, thanks for being here. Uh, God bless you and the work you've been doing for 30 years. Like, that's an mm -hmm. awesome goal, by the way, also. And continue to do for the Catholic Church. And uh, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much. And God bless you and all your listeners. <laughs>